Is it whistling? Good morning. Merry Christmas. <laughs> so we got snow, and the big Christian holiday around the snow is Christmas, right? So it's got to be Christmas. Uh, I guess we're getting possibly some snow this week, too, which is crazy. So who knew? Uh, we're just going to make a couple of announcements before we start, and so I just wanted to uh, get us started here. I um, wanted to remind you guys that we have our uh, prayer groups, uh, of course, every Saturday, but there is a new change. Um, this week, we have, uh, we, we're beginning to have the ladies start at 10 o'clock, so um, I know the guys started at 10, and we're, so we're just going to do 10 o'clock for both of them. The guys are going to meet here by the fire. And the ladies are going to meet there in the cold room, so. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, we thought we were special by having the 10 o'clock, and now we're not special anymore, so we've got to find something. So we're going to meet it. <laughs> Chivalry is dead. Uh, so we're doing prayer uh, at 10 o'clock every Saturday. Uh, love to see you guys there. Um, don't forget we have our Joshua study. We're going to be finishing Joshua actually this coming week. And so, uh, so we're, gonna do, we're just going to do one more lesson in that. Uh, and then for those of you who are not normally here, and for those of you who are online, um, I wanted to remind you that we have Revelation typically. This is going to be a different Sunday because it's Resurrection Sunday. <laughs> you see me almost say Easter. I don't say Easter anymore. No, um, it's Resurrection Sunday. And so, uh, and so, but don't forget that we have our Revelation study on Sundays, and, uh, and it's a deep dive. And so I hope you're ready for it. Uh, I, I, I do want to say this about our Revelation study. Um, I believe that Revelation is often used in, or, or, or maybe portrayed in a scary way. And I just want to say I believe that the book of Revelation is meant to bring confidence to believers so that we know we have a defender and that defender does business when he's ready to do business. So, um, so I believe that Revelation is meant to be a story of hope for those who have been oppressed. And so that's especially in the end times. So uh, you'll see my, my approach is a little different with Revelation. Uh, we do have also a ladies study. And so Brittany, come on up. This is really tall. <laughs> It's okay, I can stand on my tiptoes. Um, I'm really excited. We are starting a new study on Tuesday. That's April 2nd. It's here at the church at 6.30, and it's called Open Your Bible. Uh, we're taking kind of a step back from um, some of the content we've been looking at lately, and we're just looking at why we open the word. We're looking at what God has for us in his word, and we're looking at maybe the reasons or barriers or obstacles in our life that keep us from really diving deep into the Word. So this is going to be a really good study. Um, there are books that you can come grab from us. They're $16, but if you, uh, you can't afford that, just let us know. We'll make sure that you can get one. Um, we have them here. Uh, just grab Aaron or I. But you do not need a book to do this. You can just show up on Tuesdays and just come in and, and enjoy and participate in the discussion, and you will still be knocked away by that. But if you like having a little bit of extra study throughout the week, I, then I would recommend you get the book because there's a couple days of work you can do throughout the week uh, in between when we meet if you do that. So uh, please come on Tuesdays if you're interested in uh, learning more about the word and also just enjoying the fellowship of some really awesome ladies. The last thing, uh, just a quick announcement here, and we can have our, our team come on up, um, but we do have a whole bunch of food from the uh, Placer Food Bank. Uh, we just had an, a, a lot of food come in this week. And so um, we want to let you guys know that if you know somebody who needs some food or if you yourself would like to pick up some, uh, we have it in the back here, I believe, right now. Uh, and then next week we'll have probably leftovers from that. So th there's, <coughs> I think there's a ton of zucchinis, cucumbers, oranges, lemons, potatoes, apples. There's a bunch. So, uh, yeah, if you, if you want to grab some, please feel free to grab some, especially if you know somebody who needs it. Just grab some and, and, and take it to them. So uh, why don't we go ahead and stand, and, uh, and let's, let's pray to get started today. Lord, we're, as always, grateful, Lord, for what you've done for us. Lord, this today is a special day to us because 
it's a day where we consider the, the way that you died for us, but more than that, Lord, the way that you rose again for us. And, and, and Lord, it's so easy to just think about the, that sacrifice that brought us forgiveness. But Lord, you've also risen from the dead so that we can also have new life in you. And I pray, Lord, that we would practice that, that we would put it into practice, that we would be lights into the world around us. And Lord, we know that that happens by, by one method only, and that is that your spirit fills us with your power. And so, Lord, I ask today that your spirit would be in this room with us, Lord, that it would not be, that you would not be distant, Lord, but that you would be in this room with us. And, and Lord, to, in order to empower us toward, uh, toward what you want us to do. But also, Lord, we ask that you would be here to empower us toward worship. Lord, your word says that you are enthroned in the praises of your people. And so, Lord, we pray this morning that you would be enthroned in the praises of your people in this church. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. We're going to get our blood pumping this morning. Here we go. You put your hands together. If you can keep rhythm, if not, no stress. <laughs> Copy. Oh, let's sing that every morning. <laughs> <laughs> because he lives, I, I can fail.
a seat. We'll take our offering at this point, and um, let's go ahead and, and pray for that, too. Lord, as we consider, again, just what you've done for us, Lord, beyond just the, the little things we enjoy, Lord, good friends, good neighbors, good family, um, opportunities to meet together, a good town, a beautiful place that we live, but Lord, we know that your gifts are so much further than that because all of those things are the things here and your gifts have been eternal. And so, Lord, we're just thankful for that. We want to offer you praise for that. And we also, Lord, as we, as we take offering, Lord, we want this to be an expression of gratitude and of love. Lord, not, not giving under compulsion or pressure, but, Lord, we just want to give as an expression of our relationship with you and the way that you've reached out to us and found us and rescued us. So we just say thank you. 
pray these things in your name. Amen.
Yes, I think we can say that. Give God a hand. Yes. It's okay to make noise.
Lord, we do recognize that you are holy. But Lord, we also understand that what that means is that you are separate, that you are different, that you are that you stand out, Lord, among all the other powers in this world, Lord. And the way that you do that, we know from your word, Lord, is that you have been gracious rather than controlling. You have you have offered freedom where you could have crushed, Lord, you offered freedom. And Lord, we're thankful for that. Lord, we still are experiencing freedom in this country. We're still ex experiencing that the right to stand here and, and gather together and worship you. And so, Lord, we're, we're thankful for that. But Lord, you're holy because you love. And we're, and we're thankful for that too, Lord. And I pray, Lord, I ask that you would cause your people to love like you, selflessly, with, with unrelenting forgiveness and kindness. And, and Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to outreach in areas where perhaps, uh, perhaps we wouldn't feel comfortable. But Lord, we know that you are the pursuer. And so we want to be pursuers too. We want to be people that love when people don't love us. And so, Lord, we, we ask that your character would be written into us and your holiness would be evident in us as well. We pray all these things, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, guys. Well, it is uh, Resurrection Sunday. So, I mean, it's to me, it's a time to celebrate and be upbeat and, and be happy. So go say hello to somebody and make them feel really uncomfortable with how happy you are, okay? <laughs> and, then, and then we'll get started in a second.
All right. Good morning, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, please return to your seats as the second portion of the service is about to begin. Sorry, Dan, you're just not loud enough. Uh, yeah, can you hear I've me? I've got okay? you cranked up. Good morning. I don't have that booming voice, Robert. Sorry. Hello. Hello. Yeah, I can't do it. See. Good morning. Let's let's have a seat, guys. Let's get started. All right. Let's try it. He is risen. Hey, we got one. <laughs> nice. This morning we were trained by uh, the Lutheran pastor here, uh, Craig, that they do a hallelujah at the end of the He is Risen Indeed. So I kind of thought that was good. It's praise the Lord, right? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So, um, so yeah. <sighs> Happy Resurrection Sunday. I'm so glad you guys are here. Um, <clears throat> and it looks like we're getting some sunlight finally, which, sound, which feels good. Glad about that. Um, we're going to do... We're going to do this a little bit differently from normal, uh, today's sermon. Um, usually, you know, we would get right into the, <clears throat> the message of, of the cross, but I feel like I've just been uh, hit so hard with the symbolism of Scripture that I, I want to I come from that into this story. So um, bear with me as we, as we sort of develop what, what I think the, the, the pictures that God has set up so that we understand the, the crucifixion and the resurrection. Um, before we do that, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get started. God, again, I ask that your spirit would be here to empower what happens today. Lord, uh, I could speak till I'm blue in the face, and I would not only be blue in the face, which would be unattractive, but, Lord, it would be nothing. It would be worthless, because we need your spirit to be here to communicate your word to your people. And so, Lord, I pray that that, that would happen this morning that you would open up our hearts, that you would open up uh, uh, our, our hands, Lord, to, to, to respond in obedience. Um, and Lord, as you say, Lord, that you would open up our eyes, Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And, uh, and so that, Lord, as we do this, that this will not just be a message by a guy named Dan somewhere on a hill, but Lord, but this would be your message to your people. And uh, so we pray all these things in the name of Jesus, amen. So, um, you guys know that I love, love the symbolism, symbolism in Scripture, and, um, you know, <laughs> I, I, I guess I didn't know how much I loved it until about a year ago, maybe a little bit more, maybe it's actually it's probably been a couple years. Um, Doug would know how long I've been in Genesis, um, but, uh, but I was in, you know, teaching Genesis, and I saw that there's a ton of symbolism that's being developed in Genesis. And so, um, for many of you guys, you've already heard me say a lot of this stuff, <clears throat> but I want to I build this in so that you understand where this is going. Um, we, saw, we saw God build um, the, the, the early chapters of Genesis with a lot of symbolism. And so you have things like uh, the, the garden, right? You have things like the trees, and, and the way that he uses the symbols of trees throughout Scripture um, <clears throat> has a lot to do with, um, with planting and, and, and reaping, you know, sowing and reaping, uh, bearing fruit. And then you see uh, things like uh, the way that God set up the day to the nighttime. You guys have heard me say this probably two or three million times, but um, it, my, that's my estimate, my loose estimate here. But we've talked about the night to the day so many times, but this is one of those ideas in scripture where God builds in this picture that's just right there in the first day, right there in the first day of creation. And as you see this develop throughout scripture, you see that this becomes a picture of uh, darkness, sadness, and evil, and then the day breaks and becomes brightness, goodness, and joy, right? So you, you have this daybreak picture that God uses over and over again. First John is a great example of this, where Jesus is referred to as the light in this world, right? And God is cast shedding his light into this world through Jesus. And of course, we want to reflect that ourselves. So we see these this imagery that God develops in Genesis 
and the, one of the ways that I put it, and, and I, I think this is um, a pretty accurate way to put it, is that God gives us the symbols from which he then develops his um, prose and his poetry. So, so he's supplying us with a poetic, uh, a group of poetic symbols or, or poetic images so that he can speak to us in, 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 in poetic terms. So you see this all the way throughout the Psalms. You see night to day, you see gardens, you see mountains, you th see things like that used as imagery uh, for his redemptive story. And so it's like the poetry of redemption has been given uh, images and symbols. So I just fell in love with this stuff, right? And so uh, this year I was thinking about, you know, how, how we would approach the Easter service or the Resurrection Sunday service. And, and I realized, man, the cross is at the center of all of this imagery. And we're going to see that as we go, but the cross is at the center of all of this. Uh, and, and the other thing about this, and this is, this is where this sort of leads, is that if you're looking at, at the cross, you want to understand the importance of the cross. You, you can't understand it without understanding the importance of the garden, what was happening in the garden, right? Because man fell, and God gives us redemption from the fall at the cross. So the cross solves the garden. And so, and so it's very interesting that here in the garden we have this imagery being developed, and then the cross is going to sort of wrap up some of these loose ends. So we're going to see this as we go. Let's start in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, and uh, I hope you have your Bibles. Go ahead and take your Bibles out and uh, take a look at Genesis chapter 2. We're going to go back to the beginning. It says, and the Lord God, that is Yahweh, right? The Lord means is the word Yahweh in Hebrew. That's a specific name. It's not the name of any other God, just one God, right? And it says the, your, the Yahweh, the Lord God, planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of that garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden. Okay, so there's this beautiful garden that man has placed, that God has placed man in. And man is brand new on the scene, right? He's just, he's like right, fresh out of the oven, right? And he's placed there, right there in the garden. And, uh, and it's beautiful. It's, it, so far, there's no death in that garden. There's, there's nothing decaying. There's nothing broken down. There's no dead branches. It's this lush, beautiful, rich location. And I like to picture it. I like to picture it uh, like, you know, some of these areas in Forest Hill where, where you drive by, and especially when it rains, everything turns a rich, dark green, right? Don't you love that when you see that? It's this rich vegetation. And I think that's what Adam's, uh, what, what, what Eden looked like. It was this beautiful, lush place. And here Adam is placed in the middle of it. And, um, and, and this just happens to be, like I'm talking about symbolism, right? This just happens to be an, an image that's used throughout Scripture. Especially, I mean, we just read Genesis chapter 2, right? We're going to go through the last chapter in the Bible, Re Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. You, it, that one's easy to find. You just flip up the whole chunk of pages, right? And just go over to Revelation. Revelation 22, 1, it says, And he showed me, this is, this is John speaking, and, and he's being introduced to the end game of what we're going to experience. It says, He showed me a pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne and from the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was, there it is, the tree of life, just like in the garden, right? So this is the new garden, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. <clears throat> the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, right? We know that the garden was cursed, right? So here we have it reversed. Um, there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face. Very important right there, because that's the purpose of the garden, is to be a location where man meets with God. We're going to talk about that a little bit more later, but they see his face. They're there in the garden. They've returned to the ultimate Eden, and there's God, right? So there's a symbol. This is an imagery that God has laid out all the way from Genesis, second chapter, to Revelation, last chapter. It's a story that goes all the way through Scripture. 
Um, and, and because of that, so you have the garden that fell and then the new garden with no curse, it becomes a picture of redemption throughout scripture. Let's give you a couple of uh, verses here. Isaiah 51, three says, the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort her with, uh, he will comfort her waste places and will make her wilderness like Eden in her garden, like the garden of the Lord. I'm sorry, her desert, like the garden of the Lord. So you see this picture of redemption that God wants to do for his people. Another one, it says, their souls shall be like a well-watered garden. Back to, back to Eden, right? You're, you're gonna, I'm going to restore that perfect Edenic experience. Um, <clears throat> remember, too, we talked about this before, but I, I just want you to see how this plays in, okay? The temple was also designed like a garden. It was meant to look like the Garden of Eden. Okay, so for instance, uh, Ezekiel 28 tells us that the Garden of Eden was on a mountain, um, which, is, which makes sense as to why the Eden uh, had rivers that flowed out from it, right? Four rivers that flow out from to each direction. And so you've got Eden as a mountain. It's on a high place. That's in Ezekiel 28 if you want to take a look at it. And then also the temple walls. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I should say this too. The temple was also on a mountain. I almost didn't make, draw the connection there. So you have Eden on a mountain. You have the temple on a mountain. Okay? The temple walls were designed to look like a garden. They were decorated with trees so that when you walked up, you were confronted with this like square, right? But, it's, but it looks like trees designed to look like the garden. Uh, and you can look at that in 1 Kings 6, 18 through 35. Uh, they were actually told, this is what you need, need to make the temple look like. Uh, and then both the temple and the garden had an eastern entry. And uh, you'll find that in Ezekiel 47 and Genesis 3. Uh, it says in Ezekiel that the, the forefront of the temple faced east. So it's supposed to be like the garden, which faced east. And we know that the garden faced east because in Genesis 3, we know that there was a cherub that was placed at the front of that garden in, in its eastern entry, and it was meant to guard people from coming in. So you have this exact imagery of the temple looking like the garden. Finally, uh, Adam, I'm sorry, there's two more. Um, the menorah, I believe, you've heard me argue for this, but the menorah was designed to look like the tree of life. I believe that the menorah is a symbol of the tree of life. And so this is beautiful picture that develops all throughout scripture. But it, when, it, when it, you get to Acts chapter two, you see the people of God and it says that there were tongues of fire over their heads, right? Well, if you're looking at that and you look at the symbolism throughout scripture for the people of God, what you'll find is th that they had a menorah in the middle of the temple. And when he uses that symbol for the people of God, he's saying it's God's people that will light up like a candle. And, and, sh and shine forth light into this world. So God's people become the new menorah, in a sense, and also the new tree of life. That's, that's the picture as it develops throughout scripture. I could take, if you want to ask me more about that and go into way more detail than I am right now, I could do that later. But, um, and then finally, Adam was told to tend and keep the garden. Now, uh, this doesn't sound like much. The words there, though, are abad and samar, tend and keep. And in, in the old language, in Hebrew, you'll find that those are the same terms used for the priests in the temple. Go and tend and keep the temple. So they would, they would, this is Adam. Adam is sort of like the first high priest and a first king in a sense in this temple location. And this temple, and I've said this before, you've heard me say this before, but the temple is like uh, a subsequent garden, right? You could say that the garden was the first temple, you could say it that way, but I prefer to say it that the, the temple is a subsequent garden with one major difference. The garden didn't have walls, right? it was just trees. You could just walk in, but there were trees. As far as I know, I don't know about it having walls. But, uh, but the temple is not like that. It has barriers of entry. You can't just walk in. And, and at the center of that garden is supposed to be the presence of God. That's what you want. You want to be with God, but God says, no, if you're approaching me in this first covenant, the covenant of law, you can't approach all the way to the center. There are barriers of entry. And so in, in the temple, only one person could go into the, into the temple and only once a year. And, and, and even when they did, it says that they would, um, would you know, start these candles and so on and so forth. So, or actually, it's incense so that the room would fill with smoke so that he would be protected from the presence of God. So even there, you have like this barrier of entry, even with the guy all the way into the center You've got this barrier of entry. You've got this, this, this removal from the presence of God. 
and that's what these walls are, right? One of the, one of the curtains, for instance, was designed to have cherubs on it. It was designed so that when you walked up to it, you were confronted with this guardian cherub. It was supposed to look like you weren't supposed to enter into it, right? There's this cherub with a sword. You don't want to enter into that place. But the real point of the garden, the real point of the temple uh, and how it symbolizes the garden is that at the center of this temple and at the center of the garden is presence with the Lord. You can be with God, right? And so, but there's a problem. Problem develops in the garden. Adam defies God. He defies God. So take a look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. This is the command. It says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Okay, so God gives him a warning. It's not a threat. It's a warning. There's a little bit of a difference. And he says, if you, if you disobey me by eating this tree, uh, of this tree, then you'll die, right? And so, but Adam and Eve uh, disobey, and they defy God. They do the wrong thing. And the result of that is that they do indeed die, right? They don't die physically as we think of it. They die spiritually. They're separated from God, right? Um, Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. Now, he's speaking this to people who are technically alive, but we're spiritually dead. And so basically, we exist in a condition where we don't have the connection with God. And this is the point, right? If you can get connected with God and you understand that he is the source of life, then to be removed from the source of life is to live in a constant state of death. It's spiritual death. And it's because we have, we've been removed from the presence of God. But Adam's sin also has consequences for the world around him. It's not just he that experiences death. Take a look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. This, these are the curses laid out. And the curse laid out to the world around him goes like this. It says, Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and and thistles it shall bring forth for you. Thorns and thistles. Throughout the Bible, thorns and thistles become a picture of sort of uh, unaccomplished intention or, um, or like if, you ha- if, if, if God has called you to something and you don't do it, then thorns and thistles are the result, okay? As an example, <clears throat> uh, at one point, Jeremiah speaks to the people and he says, um, where you have sown in wheat, you have reaped in thorns. This is Jeremiah twelve thirteen. You have sown in wheat, but you have reaped in thorns. In other words, the, the fruit of your labor is not working because it's cursed by sin, right? So there's, this, there's thorns in the garden. That's the symbol. There's thorns in the garden. Another one, uh, if you remember the story of Joshua, they were told to, to go in and to uh, drive out the inhabitants of the land. There was a lot of sin. There was a lot of child sacrifice, human sacrifice, things like that. And so he just said, you've got to get all these people out of here. And um, in Numbers chapter 33, verse 55, it says, But if you do not drive out the inhabitants, those whom you let remain will become irritants in your eyes and thorns in your side. You don't want that thorn in your side. Does it remind you of Paul at all? Remember he talks about that? At one point, Paul says, this is 2 Corinthians uh, 12, 7. It says, A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. In other words, Paul's ministry was so successful and he was revealing mysteries and people might get to the point where they would exalt him beyond what he should be exalted, the way that he should be exalted. And so in order to keep him humble, God allows him to remain with a thorn in his side. Now, this is my theory. Um, I I like to let you guys know when I'm talking theory and not just, you know, straight out scripture. But my theory is that Paul had uh, not conquered all areas of sin in his life. And as a result, he had let one thing remain. Just like the people left the giants in the land and the giants became thorns in their sides, Paul had let one thing remain and he hadn't finished it off. And so God says, okay, from now on, you're going to have this thorn in your side. And he prays for it to go away. And uh, and he says, no, I'm going to keep, I'm going to use it to keep you humble. And you're going to have to depend on my grace because my grace is sufficient. So keeps Paul humble. Um. But you, so you have this imagery of thorns throughout Scripture. Thorns are a picture of, of, of uh, uh, unfinished potential 
and, uh, and, and, and curse in, in the land. It, it, there's a, a, an experience of a curse in our lives. Um, and, and this is a result of the fact that we have sown in disobedience and bear fruit, right? Uh, Genesis, uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Very intense language there. God is not mocked. He says, whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Consequences, right? That's what we have to deal with, consequences. Now, here's, this is something that I've been thinking about for some time. Um, have you ever had an experience where you, you did something and you knew the consequences would be bad and you kind of thought maybe it won't happen, but then it happens? And, and y- there's this little moment, I don't know if you've ever felt this, I, I, I hope you haven't, but there's this little moment where you just want to reverse you want to put the world in reverse, right? You want to back out of it. You don't want the consequence to happen. Um, so I think I've told some of you this story before, but a long time ago, uh, I, I grew up a, as, a, I guess you could say, an artist, right? I did a lot of drawing as a kid. And, um, and, and so I was at a conference once, and I was sitting in the back. I wasn't like a defiant kid, but this is where I happened to be. I was sitting in the back, and I was drawing, and uh, I thought... The, the speaker is, uh, he's a funky looking guy, so I'm going to draw the speaker, you know, and I, I used to love caricatures. So I was sitting there, and I drew this great caricature. I, I was pretty proud of it, you know, and it, w- it just, it was like where it looks more like him than he does, you know, and I, I gave him a nose, I mean, a pretty big nose, and I was sitting there, and, uh, and there's this kid, I'm so proud of myself, you know, and there's this kid right next to me, and, uh, and I look over, and I'm like, check this out, I got the speaker here, and he looks at it, he's like, yeah, that's my dad. <laughs> and I'm like, there's that little moment where you're like trying to reverse, you know. I just want to go backward a little bit, you know. Because once the consequences are there, you can't back out, right? They're just there. You have to deal with it. Um, on a more sobering note, I know that uh, the Half Dome, you guys, how many of you have been to Half Dome? Okay, my brother has been like a million times. I, my dream is to go to Half Dome one day, one of my dreams. I just never get to do it, you know, it's just a big several day excursion, you know but there's this, there's this um, I guess as you get to the top as you get forward to the front of it where the cliff goes off, it gradually s- sort of tips down and it's so gradual that you can't really feel it, and so people will get to a certain point and they're sort of testing themselves and they'll get up to the edge and not realize that it's at a, cer- at a certain point it becomes too steep to back out and there have been people who've lost their lives because they s- didn't stop when their friends were telling them to stop. They, they didn't stop when the signs said to stop, you know? And so there's this little moment where you're going too far, and there's, now there's just consequences. And so I, c- I can imagine these people, when they get up to that point, they're like, oh, I feel good. And then suddenly, the consequences are there, right? That jump in your heart, oh, I want to reverse. I want to go back, you know? How many of you guys have felt that? I- I'm sure somebody's felt that before. Like, I want to go back, right? Um, I've said things in my home <laughs> that I have regretted. I mean, how many of you have ever said something stupid at home? Let's, let's see that one. Okay, I'm, I'm getting more hands, a little bit more par- audience participation. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've said stupid things at home, and the moment I said them, I wanted to take it right back out and put it back in my mouth and chew it up and swallow it. You know, I just wanted it to be gone. And, and there it is out in the open, and my wife has heard it, you know. And, uh, and, and so there are these moments where you have consequences. And this is, a, this is something that's built into our world. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. What is the consequence of sin? Death. How many of you have ever sinned? Everybody but Janice. Janice. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I'm going to take some training from you. <laughs> no, uh, but, but we've all sinned, right? And so we all should face death. Those are the consequences, and God is not mocked. How do we get out of this, right? And you know the story, but this is how the gospel is built. It's built to let you know there's a consequence to sin. You face that consequence, and there's no way out except this one. And that's the gospel, right? So um, I also wanted to point this out. This is fascinating. Let's go to Matthew chapter 22, verse 20. I'm sorry, 27, verse 27. Matthew chapter 27, verse 27. 
we're fast forwarding to the solution to the garden. And we're going to see some of this garden imagery in this. And we're going to see thorn imagery in this, okay? Matthew 27, 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and they gathered the whole garrison around him and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him saying, Hail, <clears throat> Hail, King of the Jews. So they're mocking him and they put thorns on his head. I can't, I can't escape the symbolism in that. I mean, do you see that? There were thorns in the garden. It's the result of curse of a curse, and they crowned Jesus with thorns. It's, I mean, it's one of the few times that you see this in Scripture, anything having to do with thorns. It's, thorns are there, and they're definitely a symbol of something, but they're not often talked about. And, uh, and so here, here you have this scene where suddenly Jesus is being crowned with thorns. Now, I was looking at the words for uh, crown. I wanted to know what the word was here. There are two words in Scripture for crown, okay? You can either be given a uh, diadem, that's, that's a type of crown, and a diadem is given to somebody who didn't earn it, they were born a king, okay? Kings receive diadems. But that's not the word that's being used here, okay? The word being used here is the word stephanos, and stephanos is given to someone who earns it. Now think about that. It's like they're putting this crown of thorns, it's not a diadem, it's a stephanos, and they put it on him and there. It's like they're saying, you've earned it. Did he earn those thorns? No. Those are not his consequences. Those are our consequences. Jesus is yet without sin in Hebrews, right? And yet he receives the consequences of sin, the thorns. So, and, and, and he did more than that, right? He didn't just take the thorns as a symbol, I guess you could say. I mean, it's more than a symbol because they literally put the thorns in his head and then like slammed the horns with a, with a stick, with a reed, and it'd be painful. So it's more than a symbol. I mean, it's a real life thing, but it is also a symbol. But he also took the shame. Matthew 27, 30 says, then they spat on him, they took the reed and struck him on the head. That's where that is. And it says, and when they had mocked him, they took the robe off and put his own, own clothes on him, and they led him away to be crucified. So he's crowned with our thorns. He's ridiculed for our shame, and then they, he faces death for our sin. Our consequences laid on him. Our consequences, not his. It's, it's so interesting that the Bible says that God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. And yet what we sowed, he reaped. To me, that's just, again, that's just one of those incomprehensible truths of Scripture. Matthew 27, 50 says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and he yielded up his spirit. So he died. He gave his spirit up. Verse 33 says, And when they came to a place called Golgotha, that is to say the place of the skull, uh, and they, they talk about how they, they went to that place and crucified him. Now, I just wanted to point this out too, okay? Golgotha is, uh, is, is a pretty interesting place. Uh, you, can you see this here? Can you see the skull there? Okay. Uh, in certain light, Golgotha straight up looks like a, soul, a skull. It looks like a skull. Um, and so there are theories, though, as to why the people at the time called this the place of the skull. And I, I did a little bit of this research, and I about jumped out of my socks when I saw this. Okay, so um, number one, obviously it looks like a skull, right? So the very famous tomb where, where people believe that Jesus was laid, uh, it's called the garden tomb. Garden, by the way. Um, you've got this garden tomb, and it's like a, maybe a stone's throw away from, like a literal stone's throw, right? Beth, Beth has been there. You could throw a stone and hit this place, okay? It's that close. And, um, and so you have this place called Golgotha, or the place of the skull, and it's right near the tomb where they believe Jesus was buried. Now, um, the, 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 I was talking about why they called this place this place of the skull. Obviously, it looks like a skull. So it's like, well, maybe that's why. And that, that is a potential reason. There's another theory, and this one's kind of fascinating to me, is a theory that uh, Goliath, Goliath, like the giant, that his skull was buried there. And which is very interesting because remember, uh, David is a picture of Christ. And Goliath is the picture of the enemy. And here, 
you know, Christ in his death placing his feet over the enemy, just like David places his feet on Goliath's head. So fascinating one there. But my favorite is one that was held by the early church. All of these are really cool, but my favorite is the one that was held by uh, several major teachers in the early church. One of them's name is Origen, O-R-I-G-E-N, Origen. He's an early church father. Uh, he lived in the, um, you know, about 185 to 253, so very early in, in, in church history. And uh, he was a Hebrew scholar, and he was uh, a church leader. This is what he said. Concerning the places of skull, it came to me that Hebrew, Hebrews uh, hand down a tradition that the body of Adam was buried there. Body of Adam, okay? You see how we're going all the way back to the garden again, right? Now think about this. This, is, this verse comes to mind when I, when I read that. 1 Corinthians fifteen twenty two, As in Adam, all die. So in Christ, all are made alive. So you potentially, I mean, this, this again, this is a, this is a uh, tradition that they held, but they believed that Adam was buried in this place called Golgotha, and that's why they called it the place of the skull. And here Jesus is crucified right above that place because in Adam all die, but Jesus has conquered death, right? Jesus rose from that cross. That's n the cross is not the end of the story. So as in all Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. Remember what Jesus said to the criminal on the cross? I love this. You, you know the scene, right? They're mocking, the one of them is mocking Jesus, and the one criminal stops him and he says, don't you know who you're speaking to, you know? Then he turns to Jesus and he says, uh, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus' response is this, is Luke chapter 23, verse 43. He says, assuredly, I say to you, today you will dine with me in paradise. Okay? So I looked up parad paradise. The word paradise is the Greek word for garden. So get that. Here's Jesus on the cross. He's dying, but he's about to conquer death. And he says, tonight you will dine with me in the garden. That's what he's saying. You see how he's going all the way back to Genesis, and he's bringing us back into that uh, Edenic experience. You're going to be in Eden again. You're going to dine with me, right? That's the presence of God. The presence of God in the garden. Incredible. Another one, Matthew 27, 51. This is what happened just after Jesus released his spirit to the Father, right? Matthew 27, 51. It says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. What was the temple veil? It was a barrier of entry into the new garden, right? The temple garden. It's a barrier of entry. And it has, it has cherubim meant to show you that you're not supposed to enter in here, right? So, so it says the temple veil was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and graves were opened, and notice, many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. New life again. Jesus conquers death. That veil, as far as my research goes, there's different people that have different views of this, but as far as I can tell, it looks like that veil is about 60 feet tall, tore from top to bottom, it was 60 feet tall, and it was four inches thick. That's what they say, four inches thick. Uh, they, said, they say a hand breadth, so it depends on how thick your hand is, but, um, but it's a very thick veil, and it was meant to keep people out. You can't come in here because you can't be in the presence of God with your sin. Jesus gives us forgiveness, and the first sinner he talks to, just before he dies, you're going to be with me in the presence of God in the garden. And then he gives up the ghost, and the barrier of entry is torn in two, top to bottom. God did that, right? incredible, the symbolism, the imagery that's in, that's in this. So, um, so what this is, this whole symbol, all these, all, the way that God uses these pictures is this, it's to show us that we've been invited back into paradise. We've been invited back into the garden, right? And who doesn't want to do that? You know, who doesn't want to do that? This is an offer that's just free. Who doesn't want to do this? It says he took the consequences, uh, uh, so scripture is telling us, that Jesus took the consequences for our sin, right? He took our thorns. He took our death. But he doesn't just do that. He takes our consequences so that he can give us the consequences of righteousness, his righteousness. So we should have had consequences for our sin. He takes those, 
He should have consequences for his righteousness. We take those. Incredible. This is a great trade, right? So he removes the thorns. Uh, a verse in Isaiah 55, uh, 13 says this. It says, instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. So this is symbols, again, of, of, of a future hope and redemption. And so instead of a thorn, a tree grows up. That's, that's what God wants us to have, is to, to be renewed in relationship with him and full of his life and his power. We're no longer to be thorns. We're no longer to be a cursed garden. We're supposed to be now trees of life into our world. Um, so he removes the thorns, but he also reverses our shame. This is in Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to, to those who are in Christ Jesus who, uh, who do not walk in according to the flesh, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, right? Why does he say it according to the spirit there? This is, I remember I read this so many times as a kid, and we would always stop right at the word flesh. So it says, there is therefore now no condemnation, condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh. Sounds good. That sounds pretty good, right? If you're not walking according to the flesh, well, then you have no condemnation because, hey, you're doing pretty good. You're not walking according to the flesh. Well, in Scripture, that's not where it stops. What he says is, you're not walking according to the flesh because you are walking after the Spirit. Because it's God that gives you the strength to not walk after the flesh, to conquer that stuff. So you, so you come to God he fills you with his life and with his strength, and as a result of that, you begin conquering the flesh. Another one here. So he removes the thorns, he reverses our shame, and he restores the presence of God. He restores his presence. Ephesians 2.13 says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, you, you who were once far off, have now been brought near by the blood of Christ. So, so we now have this ability to be near to God. And you can look at Ephesians chapter 2, the rest of that chapter. It's all about breaking down the barriers of, of the temple and being accepted into the center again. Okay? It's all about that garden and coming back to that place, and you can walk with God again in the cool of the morning, just like they did in Genesis. Okay? So he removes the thorns, he reverses our shame, he restores the presence of God, and as a result of that, he restores life. Okay? So Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, let me just clarify that. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, who is him who raised Jesus from the dead? God, the Father, right? So if the spirit of the Father, he doesn't just say Father, though. I'm going to go back. He calls him the one who raised Jesus from the dead. And there's a reason for that. He's, he, this is the Father, but he's emphasizing the fact that God has conquered death as exemplified in his Son. Okay? So he says, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead, that is again the Father, will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit that dwells in you. So now we as believers who typically would walk around in sin and weakness and brokenness and death, now we have life given to our mortal bodies and we have as the, the example Jesus who was raised from the dead victory over death. So here's, here's a, a frustration that I, I grew up with, okay? I heard about the cross every Easter, and that's good. I'm not saying that's bad, okay? I heard about the cross every Easter, and I remember the impression that I got. I don't know if anybody ever, ever said this outright, but the impression that I got was, look what you did to Jesus, right? Look what you did. Your sins put him there. That's true, okay? Your sins put him there. He died for your sins. Look what you did to Jesus. How could you? You know? And I, get, I walked around with this feeling of guilt all the time because look what I did to Jesus, you know? Um, you know, I, mom finds out I'm doing something wrong and I lie to her. I just crucified Jesus, you know? And the thing is, Paul says that. You crucified Jesus anew, right? With, with your sin. No, that's in Hebrews. But, um, but you, you, there is a, a problem when we just pursue sin, and, and, and there is a sense in which we are crucifying Jesus, but that's not the end of the story. What I'm saying is those things are true, but they're not the glorious end of the story. The glorious end of the story is that 
Jesus has conquered guilt and sin and shame and death. And I'm sorry to say it this way, but shame on you if you land a person in shame and never take them out. So, I mean, I know I just said shame on you. <laughs> so I don't know what to do with that. But, um, but the truth is we shouldn't leave people in shame. We should bring them back to the place where they have found the hope of the resurrection. And the reason for that is, is because in our lives, we, we do have a hope for the future, right? We do believe that God will raise us from the dead one day. But right now, I'm living here, right? And I'm going to be here for the next five minutes or so at least, right? I don't know how long it's going to be, but I can pretty much trust for the next five minutes unless like a bomb comes through the ceiling. I mean, I know I'm going to last for a while, and I'm still here, and I'm stuck with my weakness, my sin, my death. I'm still stuck with these things. But the scriptures tell us that Jesus conquered death and his spirit gives life to the mortal body. And so we need to be living in that victory. That victory has been given to us for free. And we need to be walking in that victory. So this is where, you know, a lot of people look at Christianity. I was reading things about this this week. Um, people read about Christianity and they say, here's a bunch of people that have been forgiven and they're scot-free and there's no consequences. That's what we were just talk, talking about, right? No consequences for your sin. And you're scot-free, all the, all the oxen free, however you want to put it, and you can do whatever you want, right? Because you've been forgiven. They don't understand the full story. This is the danger of removing the, the resurrection out of the story because the story ends not just with you being forgiven, but the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is now in your life, and he can give you power toward righteousness you didn't have before. So I guess my question is, a, you know, talking about the resurrection today, are you living the resurrection? Are you walking in that power? Are you victorious over unforgiveness, sin, hatred, lust, murder? <laughs> I hope you're not fighting with, struggling with murder. But uh, if, you're, if you're dealing with murder, raise your hand. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? We deal with things here in this world. We're here, and, we're, and, and there's weakness and there's struggles. But God has said, you are more than conquerors in Christ. And so we should take that victory and walk that victory, not just keep it a theory, but walk in that victory. And by doing that, um, then we can show, we can show the light of Christ in our lives. Um, I'll just finish by saying this. To me, it is, it is uh, an incomprehensible travesty and an incomprehensible grace at the same time that Jesus wore our thorns on his head. My hope is that as a believer, and I hope that your hope is the same, is that we will crown him with better crowns than that. We will crown him with better crowns. It says in the scripture that he will be crowned with many crowns, but the crowns will no longer be thorns. The crowns will no longer be the result of our sins. The crowns will be uh, uh, offered back to his, at his feet because he has offered us righteousness, right? And when we receive the reward for our righteousness, at some point we just say, you know what, this was always your righteousness. And so I want it to be at your feet. This is, this is not my righteousness. And so, um, and so our hope is that we would crown him with better crowns than, than the thorns in the garden. Um, let's go ahead and, and come on up with... Uh, with the last song here. Before we sing this last song, I want to ask you some questions that are, you know, basic questions you'll know. But who is Jesus? Is he just another guy? Is he a really good guy? 
or is he the God of the universe? So when we think about God wearing our thorns, I think we should think about that in terms of not just, you know, our sins did that to him. We need to think about his grace in doing that for us. The focus is not us. The focus is him. So let's keep, let's keep thinking about it in that way and understand that he did this for us. He took our death. He took our thorns. He took our shame so that he could give to us instead, uh, you know, fruitfulness, righteousness, and a lack of shame.
Let's give God a hand. Lord, we do want to live in the victory that you have given us. And Lord, I know, I know that there are people in this room who are, who struggle, Lord, that they deal with things. They struggle with uh, sins and habits and, and weakness and things like that, Lord, but, but you have redeemed them and you've changed their heart to desire that transformation. Uh, and so that, so that, Lord, on one side, they, like Paul, they, they, they don't want to do the things that they do, and yet, and yet the, the flesh is weak. Lord, I pray that you would call them to the faith that they need to trust that your power, not theirs, is the key. And so, Lord, uh, we're, we're thankful, Lord, that you've given us that power. We're thankful that you have conquered death. And we pray, Lord, that, that you would cause us to walk in that victory. And, uh, and as a result of that, Lord, we pray that, that uh, where you have taken our thorns away, Lord, that we will uh, instead come to you with crowns that you are worthy of, Lord. And, um, and so, uh, Lord, we pray that, that, uh, that you would be uh, crowned with, with the righteousness that you deserve, um, the actions of your saints, Lord, that you deserve, and that you would be um, praised among your people. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. <coughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> Love you guys. <laughs> sung my throat out. <laughs>